So John Bartle came to Monrovia because his wife's family had come to Monrovia. Actually, they came to Duarte first in 1885. That was Stephen Bowerman, his wife Annie, and probably, I believe there were five or six Bowerman children. They came in 1885 for Stephen Bowerman's wife's help from Canada. I think that John Bartle and his wife probably came to visit the family later, liked the location. By that time, Monrovia had been established. In fact, in Stephen Bowerman's biography, he talks about William Monroe coming to call on him and inviting him to relocate to Monrovia. And Bowerman said, what's Monrovia? And Monrovia said, well, it's a brand new community that we are founding, and I'd like you to come live there, and they did at Monroe's invitation. So by the time John Bartle and his wife came to visit, Monrovia had been established. They liked the potential. So Bartle went back to Michigan where he had a banking, had a, a I think it was a dry goods store or something like that. He sold out, relocated to Monrovia. Started working for the First National in 1890, and I believe became the president in 1894 and served as such for 30 years until it was merged into the Security Trust and Savings Bank. Another early employee was William Albert Chess, who was in real estate first with his brothers, and after the collapse of the land boom, needed another occupation since nothing was selling. So he too went to work for the First National Bank, served for many years as its cashier. In fact, it was he who used to go outside and wait on Lucky Baldwin while Baldwin was still in his tally ho from Santa Anita. So they became financial experts locally and regionally. And if they used, there was a saying, if anyone wanted information about local finances or business product, business prospects, they were advised to go ask Bartle and Chess because if anyone knows the lay of the land financially, those two will and can advise you. Ask Bartle and Chess. William Chess retired, I believe prior to the merger or maybe at the time of the merger. Spent the remainder of his life here in Monrovia. He was a, an, a poet of some note and wrote a number of things. It was published in a small booklet entitled Fireside Fragments. His daughter, Edna, was artistic in nature, and for many years she was the head of the art department at Monrovia High School. His son, Claude, was interested in radio, so many, for many years, Claude Chess sold radios and later on TVs, first in a location on Myrtle Avenue and then later on West Foothill. And where was the, the Chess office and the Chess big home. Okay. Well, the Chess real estate office was on Myrtle Avenue, north of Lemon. And it became, after the land boom was over, Chess moved the house, and moved the former real estate office to 148 North Ivy and made it into his personal residence to some identification some moderations, modification. And then later, after they moved to their larger home, it was remodeled in a craftsman style. But the core of the present building is that real estate office that was on Myrtle Avenue. And there are a few fragments of the original interior left, like some of the Victorian door moldings and window casings are still there. Probably around 1900, I say that because when the 1897 souvenir edition of the Monrovia Messenger came out, there's a picture of the Chess home on Ivy. By 1902 or 1903, they had purchased the former Jefferson Patton House at the corner of Foothill and Magnolia and were living there. A large two-story brick house 
built with local brick from the Johnson's Brickyard at Myrtle at uh, Mayflower in Colorado with some nice, very nice exterior detailing designed by Luther Reed Blair. The house was designed by who? Luther Reed Blair, who was the Monrovia's first local architect. The Chess family lived there until the 20s when the company, the organization responsible for the construction of the Aztec Hotel decided for whatever reason that that corner would be an ideal hotel site. So Chess was pressured into selling the location for the hotel, sold it reluctantly, and moved to a new house on Highland Avenue in Monrovia. So the Aztec, if there are rumors of a ghost of the Aztec, I would suggest it might be the ghost of William Albert Chess, who was pressured into selling even though he was perfectly content in that house and was basically forced to move by public sentiment. So that house was torn down? Torn down and replaced with the Aztec Hotel. There are pictures of the house looking towards the northwest. One picture in one of, in a regional publication showing it looking from the north back to the northeast, and a nice, beautiful wraparound veranda, full two stories, ornate as I said, ornate gingerbread for the porches and the roof of the house. Very, very nice, high-end Victorian house. As far as I know, the only two-story brick home ever constructed in Monrovia. And so the baseboards that are herons? Yeah, the, well, the, the enclosure underneath the porches was of cranes. Cranes. Yeah, the, the vertical siding, each, each individual segment of siding had the outline of a crane cut into it. So if you look at it as a whole, you think, oh, that's nice, it's very regular. But then if you look at the individual images, you think, wow, that's a crane. So did anybody copy that design? Somebody did. When the Blair House was moved, when Luther Reed's Blair's personal residence was moved back from West Doherty Road in 1993, thought was, well, are there any pictures of the house in its original location? So there would be some information regarding <clears throat> the original foundation. There weren't any. So the idea is, well, fine, let's use the architect's own design to use to, for the enclosures for the porch on his house that will, would once again be on a raised foundation as opposed to the location on Doherty Road where it was on a stem concrete stem wall foundation much closer to the ground. It was like three steps off the ground on Doherty Road. Originally it was probably about six or seven steps off the ground as constructed. And you can tell that because if you look at the chess house designed by Luther Reed Blair, the front porch was about seven steps above the ground outside. What else about the Luther Reed Blair? Designed the uh, Orange Avenue School, a couple other nice residences in the movie. But the Chess House, as I say, there are just pictures. There is one picture of William Albert Chess included in Fireside Fragments. Shows him sitting probably in the front parlor or one of the parlors. And behind him you can see a fireplace mantle quite ornate that gives you some idea of the interior, how the interior of the house is finished, probably with high-end woodwork and ornate mantles to match the overall quality of the house. Anything else about the Bartles, John Bartle, or did we? No, except John Bartle for many, many years was involved in buying and selling properties. They owned a house at one point, either owned or rented a house at Foothill and Magnolia. And then a little later, they bought 
the Cyrus Campbell House at Heliotrope and Wild Rose in the Pacific View Tract. They were living there probably in 1891 when the Saturday Afternoon Club was formed. My grandmother told a story about by being invited together with her niece to attend a birthday party for Kathleen Bartle Brown, the Bartle's daughter. That, at that point, they were living in Duarte. And they arrived in Duarte to attend the party, only to find out that the party had been canceled because Kathleen Bartle had developed measles and was contagious. Well, I wondered why they would be invited from Duarte since they were not close neighbors. Until later on, I realized that my grandmother's grandfather lived down the street from the Bartles on Heliotrope, so they would have known each other through that association. I told this story to Kathleen Bartle yesterday, uh, many, many years later, and she remembered, yes, she said the sad part was it was me that measles or somehow that was communicable across species because she said, sadly, she were two kittens that also contracted whatever it was she had and they had to be destroyed because they were ill with this disease that they could not treat in the cats. Anything else about the Bartles? Well, I mentioned the Saturday Afternoon Club that Amelia Bowerman Bartle was the founding president and served as president during the first seven or so years of the organization. The founding members, some of them were near neighbors like the, the Cogswell sisters, lived a block away. They were included. The Hutchinsons, I don't know where they lived in the Novia, but some of them were near neighbors. The other story I heard was that the club itself originated from a reading circle that women had in the early days. Reading circles were not unusual. The Woody Reading Circle started in 1909 and still persists in another form today. So that uh, another founding member of the Saturday Afternoon Club was Lulu Pyle Little, General Little's daughter. She went on to move into Los Angeles and belonged to the Los Angeles equivalent of the Saturday Afternoon Club in LA. In fact, when she died in 1909, her eulogy was delivered by a former club president. I think it was the Saturday or the Friday club in LA. An early, prominent organization whose goal was education for the masses and votes for women. Since the Saturday Afternoon Club was behind the establishment of the Monroe View Public Library. Before our library existed, where would the reading club have gotten books? Well, they probably bought them. They may have I'm assuming they may have either read them collectively, read a book collectively, or read it individually and then got together collectively to s discuss the book. When they decided, when their goal became to establish a public library, they would have an event, fundraising event, actually probably a social event, but price of admission to the social event, let's say a tea, a formal tea, would have been a book that would have formed the nucleus of a public library collection. So they did that for a number of years until the city trustees formed a library board and allocated funds for a library and a librarian. And at some point in time, there is an enumeration of what the Saturday Afternoon Club turned over to the city to be utilized as the nucleus of the library collection. It was so much in cash that they raised through fundraising and a number, certain number of books that they had amassed through their book collecting activities. The 
first librarian was Addie Schrode, or Addie Bowerman, who was Amelia Bartle's sister. And Monica Greening, a former library division manager, looked up what she was paid. I think it might have been a dollar a day for minding the library. And I think the city might have paid a dollar a month for the rent of the room in the granite bank building to house said library. <laughs>